Hey guys, Sam here with Scrappy Industries. We're back on trying to tear apart this Bay City engine. I don't know if you guys remember sort of the whole story, but this is my cousin's 1941 Bay City shovel. It sounded like it had a knock in it at the fall show at Brownsville, so Frank and I took the side access cover off, checked the rod bearing on number one because cracking injector lines, we thought it was number one that was causing the issue. Number one rod rattled around a little bit on the crankshaft, so we're thinking that we have a bad rod bearing. There's really no way to get it out in the machine. I couldn't get my hand in that access cover. There's cotter pins on the rod bolts. I couldn't get them off from the side, so the oil pan has to come off. More or less, the engine has to come out. So we hauled the machine home, pulled the engine out, got it in the shop, and we also have the greater donor engine in the shop. I think at this point, just due to lack of parts availability, we're gonna try to swap the bell housing and the front cover from the Bay City over to the grader engine. The reason we have the swap covers is due to the mounting in the machine. The grader had basically hung out. It was only mounted to the bell housing and the oil pan, but on the Bay City, it's supported out near the radiator. And that whole front cover, the way it holds the rad in the mount for the front of the engine is totally different. So we need to swap that front cover and in order to do that we have to pull the camshaft because the front structure is behind the camshaft so there's a lot of tear down to do on both engines to make this swap happen let's get to it doing a little radiator removal package get her prepped for a washing I gave him a little anti-rotation tagline here. You're doing a wonderful job. Oh, yeah. Blast. If only we had steam. <laughs> that would help. Did not bring the steam washer home from work. A whole lot better than she was, if nothing else. How much does this thing hold? Uh, 
probably more than that pan. Getting the oil drained out of her. Finally start tearing her down. Next up is drain the fuel filter housing. We think this is the drain. Sure. How could it not be? When your fuel filters hold like two gallons of fuel, you know you're doing it right. We got that and then we also have somewhere on here is a drain. Yeah, that nice pipe plug at the bottom. There's a separate oil for the injection pump only. These are not lubricated by the engine oil. Lubricating oil. <laughs> Poor little pump. So the water pump needs to come out of the way and the fan. The whole injection pump has to come off at the fuel filter housing, so that's this section of bolts here. And it should just pull right off there. And then once we take the front cover off, there's a row of bolts holding the accessory drive and that comes out of the way. This is the accessory drive we're working on coming out. I think this gear is driving the transfer pump and then this one's driving something else? Not 100% sure. But basically there's a row of retaining bolts along here. You reach through the gear and take them and pull that out the front. You know, is there any real reason to even have to do that? If you just leave the pump and everything on that front cover, well, we want to, we want to change pumps, I guess. I was like, you, if you could just, yeah, I was thinking that if too. you could pick the weight of all this with the crane yeah. and just take it all off. Which I mean, probably. So to loosen or tighten the fan belt, it seems like this screws in or out and you wedge the belt up on this V, but it is stuck. Beauty. <laughs> the fan can use a little bit. She is tight. Bronze impeller, it looks like. So right now our plan of attack is pull the front cover and make sure that everything interchanges between these two engines. At this point, we're trying to use as much of the greater engine as possible. I know I'd love to keep this thing more original, use more of the original Bay City engine, but this engine is very tired and the greater ran very well. You can't buy a lot, really any, internal parts for these engines. You can't even buy head gaskets. Bearings seem to be hard to find. You can't get pistons, rings, things like that. So we're trusting what we have going on with the grader. Sorry. Temperature gauge sensor. I thought this was kind of funny on this engine. This is the thermostat is actually in this upper pipe. Whereas obviously anything later, they kind of moved it down here near the water pump. That's the reason the water temperature sensor could be in this upper radiator pipe. There it is. More than nothing. So if you have a special little crank barring tool, you can turn the engine over from the crankshaft there if you're adjusting the valves or things like that. This has two threaded holes here. We're gonna have to come up with some sort of puller as this is a tapered lock that holds the damper and pulley on. I don't even think we need to unbolt them from each other. I think the whole works will come off there together. We'll call this a four and a quarter hole spacing from here to here. Thank <laughs> you. 
need more. So we're gonna to try to leave this bolt with a nut on it to push off the crankshaft. And those other two holes will attach in there to the dampener pulley. You ready to try it? Let's do it. I think this one bolt was on the Titanic, but these are the only two. <laughs> two and a half components. Yeah. Hey, there it is. Nothing. Good, and that was some bri bars. <laughs> Front of that crankshaft looks like new. It's interesting. That was a lot of effort in machining that. Well, I guess we need to set it down. You got the front oil pan bolts. Yeah, because that mount is attached to the spar we're trying to take off right now. And if we get that mount off, or we just set it on the floor and then it'll hold it all anyway. <laughs> just get it close to the ground and we can finish taking the front cover off and it'll just sit on this mega stand. Raise it down. The reason this front cover has this whole extra big bump out the grater doesn't have is this is where the governor is. And there's linkage holding us on there now. Which makes sense because the grater has that whole box back here for the governor. So I was pointing out before, this one doesn't even use that drive. That's why. All right. It's just like... All right, let's get on to our next progress here tonight. We don't have Scott with us. He's on basketball mission again. But... My first action tonight, I'm thinking we're gonna to try to take the injection pump off this thing, and then we'll be ready to pull the valve covers, pull the rocker arms to get the pressure off of the lifters. Then I wanna pull the whole gearbox clutch assembly off the back, and eventually we're gonna to have to stand it up, pull the camshaft, and then we'll be free to pull this front cover. Let's get going. I'm gonna crib under the front of this thing so we can take the weight off of the T-Rex. And we'll be able to use that to pull the injection pump off. I don't have enough of the nice little plastic or metal caps for both of these engines, so here we go. Factory. <laughs> all this is doing is adjusting the spring tension pulling against the rack from these flyweights here. This engine just never seems super responsive like when you're digging it would kind of fall on its face so I'm hoping we can keep the injection pump and governor and everything from the greater engine when this is all said and done. But we need this rear front cover timing case so we're gonna have to unbolt the whole fuel tower and injection pump. I'm trying to take this whole thing as one unit We'll swap them 
to this front cover, keep the greater fuel tower and injection pump if possible. How much extension? All of it. It's wild to me to think that this engine was so cutting edge in that era. I mean, you figure this thing would have been designed in the 1930s. Diesels really weren't around all that long. Cummins started in 1919, obviously one of the earliest diesel engine producers, at least in the US. Caterpillar's first diesel was in the Cat 60, which they then offered as a, a retrofit for the gasoline 60s. So I think that was in, must have been in the late 20s. They were making the 60 when Caterpillar was formed by the merger in 1925. I'm sure someone, someone in the comments can let us know if I don't get to do a little Googling while I'm editing. Not happy, Bob. Well, I don't think I'm losing my mind here. It tells you to take the bolts out. That's the whole bearing holder. Everything we're trying to take out. They don't have the transfer pump or anything pulled off. So I think it just maybe you need to try a little harder. I'll give her the old twofer. You think they would give you like uh, threaded jack bolt holes if it's that hard to get it out of there. But the book also says there's holes in this gear for you to put a socket through, which maybe that's how the newer style over there is, we'll find out. I can tell there should just be like a tang drive from this accessory drive to the pump camshaft. But I don't understand why this doesn't want to move. This would be your supply of fuel coming in. I'm gonna try to softly persuade this accessory drive into moving. Almost like the book said, just remove it. Pick that engine up a little bit, take the weight off, buzz these two bolts out. Hopefully this separates. I'm thinking the clutch, the disc should just pull out of that ring. If they don't, worst case scenario, we'll just have to unbolt that ring from the flywheel and keep turning a little bit to get to those couple bolts through that hole. But I hope we don't have to do that. Oh yeah, look at that. Already moving for us. Just so we don't hurt anything. Okay. Oh God. Oh, that was a lot better than the grater. Oh, look at that. These clutch discs are in three pieces here, it looks like. They just kind of slipped in there. Flip inside of there. And then their teeth. There's three of these clutch frictions here. Their teeth run inside of that ring on the flywheel. Then when you engage the clutch, it just 
clamps them with these two discs. I'm not sure if this is a twin disc clutch or not, but I think the twin discs work more or less like this. So I'm having to tell you in, which causes you to have to hoist up to make up for the loss in length of boom. So that kind of adds to this whole challenge. Ta -da! Well, that went better than I expected. Having a remote worked flawlessly there, so woohoo! We'll call that a win. Last time I flipped an engine was the E9 for Superdog. I had to do the same thing. I put it together with it stood up and had to flop it down, and it went pretty poorly with the forklift and I was relatively terrified. So I'm happy with that. I'm also ready for bed. Tomorrow we'll get into tearing the oil pan off, show you guys the bad rod bearing we're this close so that won't be hard to take off. We're gonna pull the rocker arms and we'll be ready to pluck the camshaft out of here. So stay tuned for more action. It's not super light, I'll tell you that. This kind of looks like it's a way of setting the oil pressure relief and it's like way out. This engine never had very good oil pressure, I bet that's why. Well, I think that tightens up. I still think there's a spring in there that's setting some sort of a relief. That's gotta be, that's gotta be sort of your main bypass. Let me see if we can, can't, can't rock it right now. So this is a four and a quarter bore engine. When they went to the D318, the next series, they're a four and a half inch bore. I wonder how much different they even had to make the blocker if they just had to open up those three eighths of an inch thick sleeves a little bit. That nose of the crank is turning. And the crankshaft's not turning. What on earth do we have going on here? Whew. Oh, I see what it's doing. This is a separate piece. Okay, that is crazy. So the, this is actually just sitting on top of the crankshaft. I thought we had a broken crankshaft. That gear rides on top of the crank and apparently that's why the damper, when you put the damper on there, that times, that's crazy. I've never seen anything like that. 
So the damper times this gear to the camshaft. I thought it was running with a broken crank. I have heard of that before. Never seen it myself. That's wild. There's actually a there's actually a bearing inside of that, and that rides on the nose of the crankshaft here. Well, we don't have a convenient way to turn this thing over right now, that's for sure. Huh. The bearing looks like new. Starting to question why we're taking this apart here because that bearing there looks absolutely perfect. Maybe we should plastic gauge it. Take a look at the crankshaft here. Also looks perfectly fine. So I slid the rod and piston back up in there a little bit. I'm mainly just trying to clean all the oil off. See if we can get a better feel for this fit right now. Number one goes on the right side. Yeah, you can. I mean, it's rattling around. I don't know if it's excessive. Saying that's only five thousandths. Sure doesn't seem excessive then. So at this point, I'm very thoroughly confused. This bearing looks just absolutely Jim Dandy. Nothing out of sorts about that. Rod cap, same way, looks good. There's no heat. Obviously, it wasn't trying to spin. I think it's neat how they did this dowel pin back then to keep them from spinning versus doing a little machined in lock tab up top here. But either way, bearing looks perfectly fine. Crankshaft looks perfectly fine. The book says you can be three and a half to six thousandths clearance. So just measuring with a dial indicator, kind of a rough guess, but our five thousandths is close. I think we maybe ought to check up and down because we were checking left and right, which is kind of where the wear wouldn't be so much. So the only other thing I'm gonna do, slap this back together. I wanna put it together anyway. Then we'll pull it up and down and see what that does. I'm just curious, it seems odd to me that we're not finding what Frank and I saw when we tore into this. There's a side access cover here. That's what we had pulled off when we were in the machine trying to find this noise because it was just that rap, 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 hammering sound. Another thought is the way this gear works and the gear slips over the nose of the crankshaft and then the damper engages this to hold it. This thing was pretty loose in my opinion. The book shows pulling it off, but I was able to slip it right off so another thought there is this could have been where the basically the, the the raspy noise was coming from between the damper and these splines don't know let's put this back together see if we can get a pull up and down on that rod check the rod bearing that way because it could be oval that's where the wear would show up so i want to check that i thought you guys would enjoy this they're saying if you use a torque wrench tighten it to 700 inch pounds but they didn't expect you to necessarily use a torque wrench. They trusted you to just tighten it enough, apparently. So we're gonna to torque these back up to the correct 58 foot-pounds, AKA 700 inch-pounds. I'm getting about three or four. I think the bearings and the crankshaft are perfectly fine on this engine. If you guys watch the camshaft in there, I'm gonna turn it over. That pushes all the, the lifters up out of the way of the cam lobes. There she is, camshaft number one.
The reason we had to pull that cam is because it was trapping this front cover, which we need on that engine. That was the last piece of the puzzle to get the front cover off. So we need the front cover and then we need the bell housing off of this engine and that's really it. Looks like we got a dowel somewhere down here. Yep. So an update on where we're at. Basically we don't know where we're at. We're confused. None of the bearings seem to be bad at all. Don't know where the noise was coming from we were originally hearing. We're going to pull one of the heads off and see what the liners look like and everything while we're here. This thing seemed to have low compression. A little bit slobbery, but it also spent a lot of time idling out there at the show, so I don't know how much of that you can really blame on the engine. You can't sneak the piston out the bottom unless you remove the crankshaft which more than anything is hard to do with the heads on to flip it upside down and get the bell housing off and pull the crank. My concern for pulling the head and why we didn't jump right on that is the head gaskets are no longer available. So I'm hoping we can reuse them. If not, we're going to be kind of screwed looking for a solution here on making a head gasket. But let's pull ahead, see what she looks like. Like you can't ask for much more than that. Rigs are all loose. Yeah. What's going on right there? That's weird. <laughs> we kind of expected to see some stuck rings or something, and we're seeing none of that. That is a lot of rings, though. Yeah. Does this whole thing turn? So it's like a ring inside of. That's interesting. Because it's a steel insert in the aluminum yeah. piston. So that's why that one was a different part number. Yeah. Unless that weird number was the just the. I don't think you can change that though. Yeah. Look. Oh, so that's like not even. It's a set screw there. Yeah, boss. Is this supposed to be loose like that? I doubt it. Oh. You come to the kind of weird. These bearings are about perfect. Pulling the next rod and piston out. Yeah, this one's loose too. So this is the super sketchiness we're finding here. Not sure if this was done as a repair or what, but this top part, it's like they machined the piston off, put a steel ring land in there, but... And that one rattles up and down quite a bit. Yeah. If that would have come off and all they have are these two little punched in dimples, it does not seem great. Might need our parts engine after all. Right now our bore gauge is set on four and a quarter, so whatever it shows is the amount of wear away from that true four and a quarter. Most of them seem to be like that one there is about two and a half thou where we're at. And there's you know, five. Overall not bad. The book says we can be 12 to 15 thousandths opened up from that four and a quarter number before they want you to replace them. So these sleeves are in good shape. I thought you guys would like seeing the aftermath 
of why we couldn't get this engine out of the grader. This is the PTO drive off the live feed. Basically, it's right here up near the crankshaft. But it should have fit through this little retainer doodad. And whatever all we have going on here, it was stuck. And that's why it wouldn't come out. I'm sure if we'd have just pulled hard enough, it would have eventually just broken this whole retainer out of there. But I don't know that that ring it's stuck on, really what's going on there, if it would have fit through the main drive spline. But that should have just slid out of there and it didn't. So that was what caused us to have to torch that off, the PTO driving and the transmission. These are the three pistons that have come out so far. But this seems to be the oddest thing. Check this out. These have been repaired the best that Scott and I can tell. These are originally a one piece aluminum piston. I think they had some sort of a steel upper ringland in them, at least the later ones did. But what I think happened is that over time, this upper ringland failed and somebody machined off the top. I'm not sure if this was a Caterpillar thing. I mean, it looks pretty legit. Machined the top of the piston down, put a steel top ringland in, and notice that's just kind of floating. That ringland will move. Then made a new aluminum top that holds that steel ringland on, put it back on, and then there's just these two dimples, that one and one 180 out. Those are all that's holding this upper piece on the piston. And of these three, two of them are loose. This is the tight one. And this one also is rattling around. So I think that might have been the knocking sound that I was hearing that I thought was a bearing knock. I think it may have actually been this piston rattling around because if we can move it this much just wiggling it, I'm sure it was doing a lot of clanging and banging, basically on the intake stroke getting pulled down and then on the power stroke when we have all that pressure just slamming against it. There had to have been some weird stuff going on there. So I got the heads pulled off the greater 4600 here and some not great news. I'm looking down over top of the holes here and I'm thinking those look just a little bit bigger than the Bay City and they are. Turns out they're four and a half inch bore, like a 318 cat, not a 4600. They're supposed to be four and a quarter. So I'm a bit confused now. I don't know, can you put a 318 sleeve and piston in these or did somebody bore out 4600 sleeves and run a 318 piston? The pistons look entirely different. They have, they have the release for the valves cut in them, a little bit different bowl shape. But the heads are not cross-flow like a 318, and they're two-piece. A 318 has a single head with the exhaust manifold on this side, the intake manifold on that side. So they're for sure 4600 heads. The block matches up in the parts book with a 4600 block. Not sure if they crossed over to the 318s, because all this looks very 318-ish at the front gear train compared to that engine that looks totally different. But once again, another roadblock. We can't just simply put these pistons in that block because the bore's wrong. We could maybe take the sleeves and the pistons out of here and put them in there. I don't know what to do. <sighs> At this point, I didn't think there were more roadblocks we could hit, but it turns out we found them. So I have to do a little more figuring here what the best route to take is yet again. We're just going to have blown apart engines everywhere and no real solutions in sight, unfortunately. So we're going to have to figure out what we're going to do. All right, so I'm getting our super fancy cheapo dial bore gauge set up to check the four and a half inch sleeves. <laughs> a little foul wear there. Two and a half. Four. All in all, very little wear. These sleeves do have a little bit of marking in them from sitting. 
But this engine hasn't run very much at all, mainly due to having that hole punched in the radiator. Matt and I did start this thing up for a little bit when it was in the grater, but got afraid of overheating it. Same thing when we were at home. So it's idled, I don't know, five to 10 minutes at most. Hasn't run much at all in a lot of years. So I don't know that I'd be too concerned. We could always take the hone, run a hone through them just to clean them up. But the real moment of truth is, are these sleeves outside measurements the same? Matt bought this real fancy liner puller, in case you were confused what it is. And we're gonna be the first ones to break it in. We've got the super duper fancy liner puller 9000 ready to roll. Just so you can see it reaches down and just kind of grabs the bottom of the sleeve there. Let's see how the mighty puller works. I would not have wanted to drive that out by hand. Yeah, that's what we got there. That just reached in, grabbed the bottom of the sleeve. Holy dirt. Oh man. There's our sleeve. As you can see is absolutely massive how thick this thing is. Yummy! Alrighty, so the oil's drained out of the greater engine. We pulled a sleeve out of the Bay City engine. Let's get this guy stood up on its back now, pull the oil pan so we can pull a cylinder pack out of this guy. See if we can figure out this mystery four and a half inch bore deal. Let's roll with it. Well, it happened. Our first dent. Womp, womp, womp. Well, I was telescoping out, hoisting down to hold the load level, and I kind of forgot about the fact that tellying out means you're going higher. At least it's not a hole, just two little dents. <laughs> I heard it creak and I was like, uh-oh. I knew exactly what that was. But she's vertical. Let's get the pan off. I'm thinking this grater was a military unit. I'm finding more and more green on it. So this is our four and a half inch bore piston out of the grater engine versus a four and a quarter bore piston out of the Bay City. See quite a bit of differences there. I find it interesting how they still have two oil control rings, but they've moved the bottom one up here. The top ring looks the same thickness, but the second and third ring are a little bit thinner than they are on the original style piston. Well, I'd say this is the original, but then modified with this 
shaky top. At least this has a one-piece piston. Does, it does look like we have a little bit of wear. You can see that wiggle there with the piston. You can see that wiggle there with the ring all the way down. It's still got a little slop in it. The Bay City's engine is definitely a little tighter in that aspect. But I'm wondering, maybe we can get 318 pistons then? Next up is the sleeve. I have a feeling there's something custom going on in sleeve land here. Boy, this thing is slick. I can tell you I already went on eBay and bought one of these. <laughs> I'm impressed. So it only has two O-ring grooves, which tells us it's more like a 4600 sleeve. That's good. A 318 sleeve has three O-rings. So one thing to point out is there's this little thin copper O-ring. I don't know what you would call it. It's like a thin copper gasket cut to a ring. But it's sheet stock. It stayed in the block here. But on the Bay City it came out with the sleeve. So that's that little bit of extra thickness you're seeing there. But with a quick glance, I think it's right. Let's do a little measuring through the crud. We're about three eighths of an inch there. Which is what it appears to be without the gasket. With the gasket, we're coming in about 405. So it must be about a 30 thousandths thick copper gasket. All right, I just reached down in the Bay City engine these are some accurate measurements, I'll tell you. So I just reached down in the Bay City engine with this snap gauge real fast. There we go. Five and an eighth it is. So I think that the greater engine is going to go right in there. This is just pretty much snug in that bore, which makes sense. But overall, that's great news. I think the sleeves here from the greater engine, whatever somebody did, I am... I'm very curious if this was an aftermarket kit, if this was somebody cobbled this together, but I think, but I think what they did is they took a 318 piston, I bet that's what this is, and I'd like to try to find if there's a cat part number on that to verify, but a D318 piston, they bored out a 4600 sleeve, because you can see how much meat there is on the four and a quarter bore sleeve. So they bored this sleeve out, you can still buy these pistons and rings aftermarket if this is a D318, 315 style, like a 7UD4 or a 9UD6 would have in it. But I think it's very interesting. It's like someone couldn't buy the parts anymore for the 4600 at some point a long time ago, and this is what they made happen, so I think that's really cool. But I guess as long as everything checks out all right, we'll, just, we'll, we'll buy new rubber O-rings for the bottom of the sleeve. We'll anneal these copper rings or just not worry about it. I'm not 100% sure yet, but we're going to have to do a lot of cleaning on the sleeves and the block and just transfer our big bore kit over from the greater engine to the Bay City. Well guys, that's gonna wrap up this video. I was really hoping this video would take us through getting a engine back together and running, but I also didn't anticipate having two engines torn down near this far. So with that being said, I apologize. This is all the further we got. This has been an absolute disaster in every sense of the word. It's a learning experience. It's a struggle. I know you guys like struggles, so it, we're doing it for you. I did not wanna spend weeks and weeks on this project. I was hoping we pull this engine out, swap a couple things over, slap the greater engine back in and be on our way, but that's not how it's going. 
Why I expected that, I don't know. It never seems to go that well. It usually doesn't go this bad either. But, but we're learning. Just every step of the way, uh, something we expected to be one way was another. All the way down to this not even being a four and a quarter inch bore. But that's cool. We're basically gonna be creating a big bore kit D4600. So I think that's gonna work out pretty well. I'm not 100% sure which heads, injection pump, and everything we're even gonna go with at this point. So we may grab more of the parts from this greater engine. At this point, it's never gonna run again. We're gonna make one of these engines run, most likely the Bay City. This thing is just a rebuild kit at this point. We saw how bad this crankshaft is. So we're kind of taking two used engines, making the best of both worlds. We're gonna have a really nice set of bearings, a good crankshaft over here in the Bay City. We're gonna retain its original block. We're gonna move pistons that are not about to rattle apart like the Bay City had that was most likely causing the knocking sound, the reason we tore into this. I thought it was a rod bearing, wasn't a rod bearing. But ultimately it's a good thing we pulled the pistons because I think we weren't too long from the top of one of those coming off and really bad things happening. So that's where we're at. Hopefully in the next video, we'll be able to get everything cleaned up, figured out, reassembled, get it running, get it painted. And that hopefully, hopefully, if everything goes according to plan, that'll be the next video. So I hope you guys enjoy watching. Scott and I struggle to death with this project, <laughs> playing with 1940s World War II era stuff. I, I assume that there was a lot of design changes being thrown at things like this. Obviously, things were moving fast in that era. They were, as Matt says, throwing things at the wall, seeing what stuck, because they didn't have a lot of experience at that point. This is pretty new. Pretty, pretty new in diesel engine world. So, this is what we got. But, thank you guys for watching. Stay tuned. Hopefully, we get this whole gigantic pile of parts put together into one running engine. I'm Sam with Scrappy. Thanks for watching.